and we were discussing on uh, kind of uh, different cryptographic algorithms and especially public key cryptography algorithm and then we i demonstrated you how do we use open ssl implementation uh, for as encryption of a file and then decryption of a file and i demonstrated that uh, and then i discussed uh, why we need the certification authority and so on uh, so before i continue in the last week i didn't demonstrate how do you go into sign some data in the fundamental level uh, so first i demonstrate that uh, and then I will move on to the lecture today. Uh, okay, so in order, uh, so what I'm going to demonstrate on the last week lecture, slide number 37 uh, and 38, there is a hands-on session which shows how to create a public-private key pair and how to use uh, keys to sign and verify. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate first. Uh, before we start in the lecture today, right? Uh, let me, in order to do that, uh, let me share my uh, terminal. Right. So in the terminal, uh, I have some files. As you see, some uh, pictures. In the last week, I used. I encrypt that picture and decrypt it and show you. Uh, today I'm going to show you how do you create a digital signature of the same file or any file you can use that. So if you want to show, uh, digitally sign, uh, so we have to use two keys, public key and the private key. In the last week I used AES, symmetric key encryption, and encrypt your file and decrypt your file. They are encryption and decryption is a single key. Now I am using two keys, one for uh, signing, other one for verifying. So public key system. In order to use the public key system, first of all, I have to create public private key pair. So for that, in the open SSL, there is a command uh, like that, open SSL. And we say generate RSA keys, and we need to give output file to store my public and private keys. So let's say the file is my keys. So then this open SSL command generate RSA public private keys and store those in the file called my keys .pem. Right? You see, it has generated. So when you see the file now using cat command, so you see this is an encoded file in the PEM encoding format. It consists of my public key and the private key, RSA keys, in, in there, all the parameters. Right. So key is generated. Now I am going to use that key to sign the document. So after I sign it, I have to send my signature and the file to the recipients. So recipients should be uh, verify the signature. So in order to verify the signature, recipient needs my public key. So I have to then get the public key from this file. I, I should not use send this file to the recipient. If I send that, recipient will receive my private key as well. The private key should not send to anybody. Private key should keep secret in your machine. We need to send only the public key. So for that, we need to take the public key from this file. So for that, there is a command uh, uh, to get the public key. Let me copy that command from the uh, uh, slides. So it's easy, I don't need to type that. Uh, so this is the command. So it says, uh, please uh, give the public key out. So it says, open SSL, RSA. Input is the key which generated, that is my keys .pe. This file will be created. 
E E M file, and then I say please out my public key. P out pub out means out the public key. If I run the command like that, so the tool will extract the public key and print it on the terminal like that. So this is my public key in the PEM format. That's privacy announcement format. That is a format which we are saving our keys. So this is my public key. So both key parameters are in this file. And now I take out the public key. So in order to send it to someone else, I have to save it in some file. For that, I redirect this output on the terminal to a file. Let's say public key dot pem. So then my public key is right to this file. So my private key is this file, public key in this file. Right. So now I want to sign. Sign a file, digitally sign a file. So for that, uh, so I have to run this uh, command. I say open SSL and then I say uh, the digest algorithm. That means hashing algorithm. So you remember I mentioned in the last week, if you want to sign a document, first of all, we need to create the hash of the document. Hash will be encrypted using the private key. Let's call it as the signature. So in order to, first of all, need to create the hash, I say, open SSA, please give the digest that will hash of this type, SSA algorithm, and sign it, sign it, uh, sign it using private key. That is my, my keys, private keys in this file. Take the hash of the program, sign it using this key, and save the signature. Out means output the signature to maybe I say my signature dot uh, sig whatever file name. This is the signature. So then, which file we going to sign? So let's say this picture file, right? So this is the command. This command says, take this picture, calculate the SHA1 hash of that, and digitally sign it using this key. Please save the signature in this file. So that's how this command works. So let's run that. Oops, I missed something. Uh, out, uh, let's see. I miss uh, open system and then the GST is H A. Okay, the algorithm should be SH1. Now, right. So it's now science. So SH1 algorithm. And it digitally signed. Signature is this. So you see now the directory, it has private key mine and I export the public key that is this uh, and then that's the public key I created this is exported you see public key and the signature this is the signature which file I sign this file I sign right so that's how signature created so now for the recipient, I have to send my image and the signature and the public, these three, signature, image, and the public key. The recipient, after receive that, he can verify the signature and see whether anybody edit this image file or not. So how do you verify that? You know, to verify that, SCPN should sign open as a cell. Then he should need to calculate same hash value using algorithm. And previously I say sign, now I say verify, verify. 
the signing goes with the private key, verification goes with the public key, right? So I verify again the signature, which signature? Signature. Signature. So signature saves here. <coughs> right? In which file I sign? This file. So now I want to verify the signature against this file using the public key. Let's run the command. So you see it says verification okay. That means no one altered this particular file. So if I, let's run this with the, maybe let's say somebody replaced my file with something else. So maybe this one. So, so I verify the signature against this. So since it is not the correct file, or maybe it's assumed that is alter file, is a verification fail. So you see that. So I remember after I encrypt this file, I decrypted into this. Actually, this cousin JPEG and new JPEG are the same image. So let me verify against that now. So you see, it's a verification. Okay, that means both files are similar. So they are checking only the content. In when they calculate hash values or signature, they only consider the content, not the file name. So you understand that both files are similar and that signature get verified. So that's how, <coughs> sorry, very simply, we can create a signature and verify signature of a file using the OpenSSL tool. So with that, I could I have conclude the lecture. So and from there, I can start the lecture today. So basically, so if you want to use uh, encryption and decryption in the public open systems, we have to use public key. So public key is a kind of, uh, we are not directly using the public key for that. We are using it with the hashing or symmetric key algorithm. <coughs> I will discuss those today. Yes. Right. Now, <clears throat> let me uh, let me now start the lecture today. Right. <clears throat> I'll go back to my slides. Lecture today. <coughs> so, lecture today, mainly discuss uh, web security. Web security. So today we will be going to discuss what web security means, and how do you achieve it? Which level we can achieve that, and how it works? What are the problems available there? Yeah. So first, let's discuss how the web system works. So as you may see in this picture, only this web system has to relay a party at the middle. So for example, the lady on inside the building would like to pass the message on the main on the road. So she cannot reach directly. So she has to talk to a middle man to reach her, him. So she say I love and the middle man send it back to the person on the road saying she loves you. So actually a person on the road may not hear the lady, but he, what he hear is the person at the middle. So the message he received, the person has to trust the middle man. So that's how the internet works or the web works. So for example, in the web system, there are so many servers. So those servers talk to each other. So if you want to load from the page, 
So it should come to different middle entities. So those entities are maybe switches, routers, maybe proxy servers, firewall servers, and so on. So you are cutting from here to there it comes through different intermediate entities. So um, in, in those entities, if these entities require, they can alter this content or they can record this content. So as the end entity here, maybe your browser, you don't have control out of that. So because of that, we, we see internet is completely untrusted environment. So you sit at your browser, type in xyz.com. So that goes to the, some servers, we call it as domain name servers. So the domain name servers resolve this xyz.com domain name into the IP address. So then ask the web to load the IP address. So uh, load the page from the IP address. So then you might get a web page from this xyz.com into your browser. However, when you get a page, you never know it is from the xyz.com or it is from the hacker.com. You never know that because maybe your DNS server, domain name server is compromised. So this DNS server may give a hacker IP address. So then instead of getting page from XYZ, you get the page from hacker, but you believe it is from XYZ. Since there are no way to verify or no way to detect that. So we say in the web system is lacking authenticity. So typical web system is lacking authenticity. So when the page loads to the browser, you don't have any evidence that it really from him or that. Similarly, if you, let's say you communicate with this server, the server doesn't know it is from you or someone else. So in the default, we don't support that. But we need to add the requirements if you want. Like for example, if you want to authenticate the server, you have to type username, password, or whatever. It's, it's actually in the application level. So this username, password verification goes in the application level. It's not in the web level or the HTTP protocol level. So then similarly, so when the page loads, you, you may not have in the typical internet or the typical web connections, you may not have a way of verifying it. <coughs> so <clears throat> if you want to this verification, what we call authentication, so we have to use different protocol. So that's what the object, uh, that's what we're going to discuss today. Right. So authenticity is one requirement. Then sometimes you might connect to the correct xyz.com and communicating with that web server, but hacker at the middle may alter in that. Don't know about it. So someone can, without detecting, could alter the internet communication. So in this situation, we say we don't have the integrity feature. Similarly, some other guy may not alter, but record, listen your communication. So since this guy is listening of your communication, we see it lacking confidentiality because typical web communication is plain text. Anyone at the middle can see the communication. So web lacking the confidentiality. Not only that, some hacker can block entirely your communication. So then it don't have availability security feature. 
So it's not the last one. So there are other requirements, especially when you do electronic transactions like payments or the internet. So if you do payments, so between the server and between you, both party has to collect evidence to those payments. So this evidence should be electronic, legally valid. So if you don't collect any legally, legally valid evidence, so we see the system is lacking non recordation So as you might see, in the typical web system is not provide authenticity of the data plus connection, communication, integrity, confidentiality, availability, and non replication security features. If you need these features, we need to use additional protocols. So the additional protocols or the security controls can be implemented in two different levels. We call, we can implement it the lower level, that is communication level, or we can implement it the application level, that is on, in our web application. So we could do it in two different layers. Today, we focus on channel level or the lower level, communication level. How do you provide the security in the communication level? Next lecture, we will discuss the application level security. Right. So when you say communication level, web communication level security, so there were several protocols and the versions of the protocols we tried from 90s to right now. So the two major protocols, basically SSA from a browser called Netscape that now Mozilla, Foundation was the code, or other one is PCT. So among these competitive standards, somewhere around 1996-1997, finally all will agree to use what we call SSA, Secure Support Layer. Then there is an organization called International Interior Task Force. They have taken this standard, uh, this protocol, and standardized for the industry and create a standard for transport layer security standard for the TLS. So present version of the TLS is TLS 1.2. So that is the major protocol which you use in between your browsers and the web servers. Or that is the major protocol which you use for cybersecurity. So that particular protocol protect the information in transit, that means it protects the data which travels from your web server to the browser plus browser to the web server. Since TLS is the dominant protocol, so I would like to go into detail of that and discuss how it works, plus discuss its available security problems. Right, TLS commonly known as SSL as I mentioned, in the TLS try to provide confidential to the privacy of the communication, integrity of the data, and partial authentication. So partial authentication means, so basically in the web communication, there are two parties getting involved. So they are web server and the browser. So in the TLS protocol authenticates only the web server. So it could authenticate the browsers, but by default, it may not execute that. So TLS only authenticate the web servers. TLS means transport layer security. When you say transport layer security, you know, basic ISO is a layer architecture of networking. We have media access physical layer, then media access control layer, IP layer, TCP layer, and of course, on top of we have aggregation. So TCP means transport control protocol. So when you see transport layer security, people think this TLS works here. So there is another protocol called IPsec. IPsec protocols actually works here in the IP layer. TLS protocols, people think works in the TCP layer. That is wrong. 
material is works actually in the application layer in this layered architecture. So if any other protocol needs the security, so they are on top of TLS. So, so in other words, so the protocol stack is looked like that. So we have physical protocol stack, physical layer, that is a media access control layer, it is Ethernet protocol, internet layer is IP protocol, transport layer is a TCP protocol. So then we have a TLS protocol or SSL interface. This is a protocol which runs on some port. So then any other protocol which works on top of TCP, that means any other application protocol, can talk directly to the TCP and communicate. If so, so this communication may not get any security. So if that communication requires security, so those application layer protocols can connect to SSL or the TLS interface, TLS port. And then the all communication from TLS to DAO is protected or kind of encrypted. So no one can interfere there. So if they directly talk to the TCP, they are plain text without having any security. So here with security. So the protocol here TLS or what you call SSL in the application layer. Right. So since the TLS is the major protocol used by the internet right now, you have to look at it in detail and need to try to identify how it works. So that is the major protocol in the cyberspace. So how TLS works? In the beginning, TLS need to agree on a set of common algorithms. After that, TLS need to share a staker to generate keys. And then TLS need to perform authentication of the web server. Finally, it may want to make sure the data which transmit between the web server and the browser is protected and it provides the integrity. How it could achieve? So that's how it could achieve. So here in the web server, and here is the web browser. So first of all, in the TLS protocol, web browser connect to web server. So in this message, we call it as TLS hello message. So in this TLS hello message consists of cryptographic algorithm supported by browsers and the key sizes and some other information. And the browser propose to the web server, let's use those cryptography and try to encrypt the communication. So when that pro proposal received by the web server, that is TLS hello, received from the web server, web server check its configuration. And if web server agree of the protocols, or the algorithm C proposed, browser proposed. Web server informed that, okay, I would like to use this algorithm for the communication. So when, after browser receives that, browser is ready to talk. So same time, web server sends his public key, public key for the communication. So as you may remember, in the symmetric key encryption, there are two keys public key and the private key. Private key you should keep, save from the web server. It never leaves from the server. The public key need to for convert into a format, what we call it as public key certificate. Because this public key needs to certify from someone. The people who are going to certify this public key Entity who certify this public key, let's call it as a certification authority. All of this certification authority is to certify and tell the world that this particular public key is him. So this format is called as public key certificate format. So as in the third message, web server sends its public key in the public key certificate format to the browser. So when browser receives that public key certificate, browser has to verify this document 
actually this document is digitally signed document. So the browser has to verify the signature of this document to make sure who certifying them. If browser can accept it, browser can retrieve the public key from this public key certificate form. So when the browser receives that public key, so they enter into what we call it as key exchange format. So in the key exchange format, browser and the web server try to establish the common key. So this key is called as a master segment. So using this key, these two parties will generate series of session keys. So those session keys will be used to encrypt the data in between web browser and the server. That is the very high level description. Right. So how do this TLS do this key exchange? I said that in this previous slide, web server sends its public key. After web server sends its public key, web browser, in the typical web browser has to use that public key to do what we call it as key exchange. In the cryptographic domain or the modern cryptography, there are three key exchange algorithms available. One algorithm is based on RSA, other algorithm is diffusion, third one is based on the elliptic curve. So practical algorithm we use today is elliptic curve algorithm with DP Helmer. I'll come to that. Standard algorithm or the uh, typical the methods is the RSA, RSA based key exchange. In the RSA based key exchange, this is very simple. There are what's happened where after a web browser received the public key of web server, web browser generated a random number. So that random number is called R. So this random number R will encrypt using the public key. Who sends the public key? Observer sends the public key. In which format? X509 public key certificate format. So after browser received that public key, he generate a random number R and encrypt that random number using the public key receives. So then the he browser sends this encrypted public key or the cyber text called C to the web server. So when the web server receives that encrypted random number, web server can decrypt it. Web server can decrypt it using which key? Private key of the web server private key of the web server. Then web server gets the same random number. So then web browser knows it, web server knows it. So then these two entities can use this random number as the master key. So you then use that master key to derive set of session keys. So those session keys will be used to encrypt the communication between the browser and the web server. So that's how typical public key RSA based public key encryption works. However, recently people found that so that typical method has a vulnerability, but we call it as forward secrecy. So, so typical RSA key exchange has forward secrecy problem. So in order to understand what the forward secrecy means, you have to understand this key exchange. So basically, the web browser create the key, encrypt that using the public key of the web server and sends to the web server. Assume at that point, some attack at the middle copy the ciphertext C. And now, so the, can the attacker get back this R? Actually not. In order to get the R, attacker should know the private key of the web server. That is not possible. But this attacker, what he might do, he may record those communication. Let's say he are recording this communication for years, and in some point in the future, so an attacker able to found the public key of web server. 
So then what happened, he could use that private key, so the private key of the then what happened? Attacker used that private key of this web server to decrypt entire sessions he recorded in the previous days. So that is called it has four secrets. If we need, if any system provides the four secrets, whatever their past communication should not be able to decrypt in the future. <coughs> if we have a way to decrypt the past communication in the future, then we say it not provide the forward secrecy. RSA based TXA not provide the forward secrecy. Why? Some attacker can record those sessions and in the future, if attacker found the private key of server, he could decrypt entire sessions and get hold of the random R, that is the session key, and using that, they can decrypt the previous or the past communication. So we don't want to see that. We want to get a solution for that. In order to solve that, there is another key distribution algorithm available. So that is called it as a DP Hellman key exchange algorithm. DP Hellman key exchange algorithm is not using public key certificates instead of the web browser and the web server shares numbers. <coughs> the number they share, we call it as a public keys. Using these numbers, they can independently derive a session key called K. So in this system, web, neither web browser or web server need to obtain the public key certificate instead of so web browser create a number called capital X using this algorithm, g to the power f x module p algorithm, and send this capital X to web server. Web server execute the similar algorithm, y to the power of g to the power of y module p. And this y is going to send to the other party, that is browser. So after browser and the server knows these x and y, they could derive a session key called K using one of these equations. So then both parties have the same key. So this key can be used to encrypt the communication. Let's say someone during that communication copy X and Y. Can they record it and use it future? No, because this X and Y only is once. In the next session, they generate different random numbers, different x and y, and so on. So, if there are no private, if private key use here, y use here, and the x simple x use here, is this post after this key exchange? So, because of that, none of these parties saving the private keys of each other. So, because of that, it, it they are not saving it. So. Because of that, we achieve the forward secret. If you have to save a private key and keep it for long, so someone can take it, this private key and attack your fast communication. So stopping it for it has forward secrecy. If you use TV Hellman, it provides forward secrecy because web browser or web server both may not store in those keys which exchange between that in the DP Hellman. But RSA, they has to keep. Right. However, so this DP Hellman system are lacking what we call it as man in the middle attack, vulnerable to the man in the middle attack. So this man in the middle attacks, what happened? So web browser talk to a web server, but somebody at the middle break this communication and simulate this sessions. So the, either web browser doesn't know he talked to the bad guy, or the web server doesn't know he talked to the bad guy. So that is the that's man in the middle attack. So DP Hellman key exchange protocol is vulnerable to such man in the middle attack. So, so then we have some 
contradicting situation. So in, in order to do key distribution, we have to use RSC or DP Hellman. If we use the RSC, we don't have the uh, over accuracy. So we can use DP Hellman algorithm to achieve this forward accuracy. But if you use DP Hellman, we don't <coughs> if you use DP Hellman PXM algorithm, we have a problem of man in the middle attack. Then what would be the solution for that? So if some man at the middle can replace the parameters that change between them, uh, because we are not checking the integrity of this communication. If we somehow preserve the integrity of the communication between the web browser and the server, we can stop this man in the middle attack. How do you do it in the web? In the web, what happens, uh, we use what we call leader signatures to achieve or the save or stop man in the middle attack. So, in, so that means we are kind of combined DV element the exchange with RSA. So a major the RS the major protocol to provide signing facilities for the electronic documents. So before doing the key exchange, all the parameters exchange between the browser and the server need to be digitally signed. So so each party corresponding to the signature sheet have access to their private key. That means only that party can kind of uh, alter this message. So if someone else alter, uh, so browser or web server can detect that. So we usually today use DVM and key exchange with digital signatures to achieve uh, or to do the key exchange in the web system, right? Now you know how do we exchange the keys. So that key is used as an input to the symmetric keys. So the real communication between web server and the web browser actually encrypt the messages using symmetric key encryption. Not, they are not using a symmetric key encryption for the encryption to protect the communication. The symmetric key encryption, which we discussed in the previous slides, which use only to exchange the symmetric key, so RSA, uh, this key or AES key. So, so let's assume using RSA, the system exchange a symmetry key. So then how do you achieve privacy or the confidentiality of information? So the people use that key to encrypt the message. So that's how we achieve that. We are not directly encrypting the data using the public key system. Instead of you use public key system to exchange the keys. So the key which exchange between these two parties used to encrypt the channel. So that's how we achieve the confidentiality or the privacy of the communication. So if we do this TLS encryption between the web browser and the web server, what are we going to encrypt? Actually, we encrypt entire communication. So if a page consists of JavaScript, it encrypts that. If the web server has any other fields or any other data, they encrypt that. TLS protocols, in simple speaking, encrypt entire communication between the browser and the web server. So then how do they achieve the integrity? Integrity is achieved using hashing technologies. So before sending any messages, TLS protocol calculate hash values. So this hash value is used to check the integrity. How would we use like that? <coughs> before sending a message, the system will calculate what we call message of indication code. It's a, it's a hash. So this hash will attach the message and send to the verifier. So the verifier then can recalculate this hash value of the map. 
and compare with the one he received previously. So if both matches, so the sender and the verifier knows they achieve the integral security feature. 2L is allowed so many hashing algorithms to do this integrity papers. The popular algorithms are MD5 and SSO1. Right, so this is about confidentiality. Then let's see how do you achieve the authentication. I mentioned that in this TLS, provide the partial authentication. That means TLS only authenticate web servers, not the browsers. So TLS authenticate the web servers using the public key system and using the mechanism called challenge response. Assume that is a web server and assume that is the client, that is a browser. So in this challenge response authentication new method, what happened? So the web browser, at the beginning of the stages of TLS, I said, web server send his public key certificate to the browser. So when the browser receives that, browser do two things. First thing they do is the key exchange. So we discussed that. Second thing the browser do is the authentication. How do they do the authentication? So browser use a mechanism for it as challenge response to achieve the authentication. In there, what the browser do, browser encrypt that and a message with the public key of the user and send that to the recipient or the server from the, uh, this is browser and this is server. So the browser create the random number encrypted using the public key revealed from this server and this encrypted random number sends to the server. So server has to decrypt it now. If that particular server has access to his private key, server can decrypt and respond to this. So that is called response. So the challenge is encrypted random number. The response to this challenge is decrypted number. So when that number receives to the A, A can verify same party who do this message or do this attack. So basically, uh, so web uh, browser, so do challenge response, that means web browser challenge to the server with the random number number, web server responds to it with decrypt number. Then web browser compare both numbers. If both numbers are equal, web browser knows, okay, this web server has access to its private key. So in this challenge response authentication, just receiving the public key of the web server may not complete that authentication. So after web browser receive the public key, the server, web browser has to execute this challenge response that will challenge the server to decrypt a random number using its private key. So server has to do that and sends the response. So with that response, actually, web browser can determine the server has access to its private key. If server demonstrate this to the browser, server believes this is the correct server. So the browser believes this is the correct server. <coughs> then, so we have this uh, uh, encryption, then we have integrity. So how do you achieve the integrity? So integrity is achieved using hash algorithms. Basically, before sending any data between browser and the server, they have to calculate what we call it as message authentication code. So this code will attach the message and send to the server. So then server basically compare these two codes and see whether this message get altered or not. So that's how they do the integrity. 
So that's how do they do the oath indication. So as a summary, so then this is how this protocol works. The deal is first time web client that is a browser send a hello message to the server. This is a server. Server then responds with the hello. The hello messages consist of the algorithms. So after they agree the algorithm with the hello messages, web server sends its public key certificate to the browser. <coughs> From that certificate, browser extracts the web server's public key. So then there's optional step. After receive the web server's public key, browser can send his public key to the web server. But in the typically, web browsers may not have public private keys. Usually only web servers has it. So then this option, of four, step four is option. So after this step, the fifth step is actually to send the client certificate. So these two is option. So web server requests the client certificate and then web browser send that certificate. So these two steps are optional. You, why it is optional? Because web browsers may not have public key certificates. In the typical installations, only web servers have it. But if some strong implementation of TLS, we can install public private key certificates on the web browser and let this public key come here to the server. So if we do so, so that usually for it as SSL VPNs, so they are both parties authenticate each other. But in the typical web communication, the typical TLS product, these two steps are option. <coughs> After these two optional steps, web browser enter into the key exchange phase. I have discussed that key exchange phase. There are two key exchange protocols. First one is based on RSA. Second one is based on Diffie-Hellman. So usually nowadays we are using Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol with signing parameter exchange because RSA this key exchange protocol may not provide over secrecy. Right. So then after the key exchange, so the Web, ser web server receives kind of a verification of the certificate message to say, so both party accept this. So this is step seven, there was option, clients in the certificate verification message not happen if the client authentication is not there, right? So then, so what's happened in the typical communication, what's happened in the typical communication, so server sends the public key, so using that public key browser enter into the key exchange phase, so that key is used to encrypt the message. So that typically happens, right? So now we have a let's we have a look. So how this encryption uh, happens in the detail. So in order to execute these steps of the protocol, TLS use different sub protocols. So for example, these are the protocol stack of this TLS protocol. TLS has kind of four different protocols, what you call TLS handshake, change my cyber specification, Walter and TLS record. Among them, we discuss these two. Actually, TLS handshake do all the hello messages and so on, and I start with the session. After that, major protocol is TLS record protocol. TLS record protocol is the protocol which protect entire communication. As in now, the key exchange and the establishment in session is over, and then we want to encrypt the data. The data means the web pages and the web forms which submitted to the servers and web pages which delivers from servers to the browsers. So that is the data. So how do you go into product the data? Assume now web browser, web server has to send this web page to the browser with this TLS. Uh, at the time we they want to send it, 
both parties has the session key they establish. So then they are going to encrypt and did putting the data into report to the web page. So what they do first, they divide a page they want to run with into the fragments, what we call it as protocol units. So we apply the security for each protocol unit. We are not protecting entire page at once. Instead of we divide that into sub frames, what we call protocol units, and apply the security to uh, each protocol unit. So let's take the first protocol unit or the first set of bytes on the page. So first of all, they do, now what we're going to do, we want going to apply the security for that. First of all, what we do, we do the, we compress this protocol unit. So usually when you do encryption or security to any data, size of the data is increased comparing to the plain text data. So, but due to maintain the network capacities or the bandwidth, we would like to keep the same size. So that, we, the, what we do, we do the compression of the information before encrypting the data. Some student may ask, why do you do the compression before the encryption. So maybe we can do the compression after the encryption as well. Why do compression here instead of there? So some people might say, do we encrypt and then compress? Can't we do that? Actually, we are not doing it. We are do compression first and then do the encryption. So there is a reason for that. Usually, compression ratios can be high, achieve high, when we see the redundancy in the data. So if there are no redundancy patterns in the data, we cannot get good compression rates. So by default, encryption algorithms remove the redundant patterns. Encryption algorithms equally distributed the data and remove the redundant pattern. So because of that, when you try to encrypt compress the encrypted data, we may not get the good compression rates. So we have, in order to get the good compression rates, we have to compress the plain text. So, so that's why in the TLS record protocol, first to do the compression. So after they do the compression, they, what they do, they calculate what we call message of indication code. So why we need message of indication code? We need message of indication code to provide the data integrity. So we then attach this message of indication code to this compressed data and encrypt the entire data set. This is compressed plain text and this is message of indication code. It encrypt the entire data set. So this encrypted data then transmit to the TCP layer in chunk. So the TCP, this is taken as the data. So then he further divide into the protocol units and add the TCP header and put it into the IP layer. So then IP layer divided into pieces as the IP header, put it into the media access control layer, and then to the physical layer, then transmit to the wire or else. So finally that data received from the other side, from the media access control layer to the IP, to the TCP, to the TLS layer. What the TLS receive is this. So after TLS receives this, they do the decryption using the session key they establish. So after decryption, they have this compressed data and the integrity checking code. They check the integrity to make sure no one out of it. So then they know it's, they receive the data without altering. So then they decompress and get the part of the page. So similarly, <coughs> each part of the communication is chunk into the pieces and compress it at the data integrity code and encrypt it and transmit. So that's how this TLS communication works. How do you know this TLS in action? So we can see the TLS in action 
by looking at the browser location bar. So if you see HTTPS instead of HTTP, you should know it's a TLS in works. So in order to work TLS, we need to have TLS web servers, TLS enabled web servers, and TLS capable of web browsers. Today, all the browsers in the market are TLS capable. And the web servers also TLS capable. However, if we want to configure a TLS, we have to configure a web server with public private key pairs. So when you say public private key pairs, public keys of this, it's in the format what we call it as XY09 public key certificate format. XY09 public key certificate formats is issued by the authorities called certification authorities. <clears throat> the role of the certification authority is to certify those public keys. So the web servers has such certified public keys. So those public key certificates consist of some fields, including the domain of the web server, domain name of the web server. So web server has to send that public key to the browser to start this negotiation. So when you issue these public key certificates, we need to have standards to naming this owning entity, that is the web server. So there is a standard for that called XY0, XY100 distinguished name standard. So XY100 distinguished name standard describes the format of attribute, a format of entity connected to the internet. So what are, who are the entities? Entities are the web servers. So in this distinguished name standard says several attributes to uniquely identify the web servers or the entity connected to the cyberspace. So these attributes are country, organization, organization unit, common name, email address, uh, URL and so on. So most important field of this distinguished name is a con con field called common name for the CA. So if that public key certificate belongs to the end user, common name should be his name. So if that public key certificate belongs to the web server, common name is the domain name. So public key certificate of the web server Public key certificate of the web server common name must be the domain name. Otherwise, web browser may not accept that public key certificate as the valid certificate. Right. So, so how web browser verifies when such certificates are used to the browser? So this verification mainly goes with the public key of the certification authority. So when a public key of a web server is received to the browser, web browser verify the signature of that public key certificate using the public key of the certification authority. So then this certification, in order to verify the signature, certification authority public key need to be available for the web browser. How is it available? In by default, those public keys are included or the hard coded into your web browser. So as you may see, I will show you in a minute, there are thousands of certification authority public keys integrated into your browser. When the browser is you see a web server's public keys, so that public key is verified using those certification authority public keys. If some browser receive a public key not certified by such known CAs, the browser is, uh, shows a message for insecure connection or a certification invalid certificate exception dialog. So when you receive such invalid certificate exception dialog, you need to be very careful because otherwise someone can execute what we call it as man in the middle attack of SSL. I'll discuss that in a minute. So because of that, web browser vendors make the user in difficult to go ahead when they receive invalid public keys from the service. 
So if someone wants, they can bypass them and go, but usually we recommend not to do that. Right, then how do you know your browser software SSL server? As I said, so the typical way of looking at it, HTTPS, so when you see HTTPS, you know, it is used TLS protocol. In addition to that, different browser shows small padlock on the location bar. As you see, there is a padlock here. So if padlock is in the lock state, that means we are using TLS to talk in between the web server and the browser. So, how do you then kind of get those details? Uh, the certificate detail, public key detail, how to know this communication is in the encrypted form and so on. Uh, let's see how this looks like on our browsers. So then you can get a feeling about how it works. So for that, I will sh share my uh, Firefox browser somehow. Let's see, I have it here. Uh, I have my Firefox browser. Uh, let's share that yeah. to you. Right. So this is my Firefox. So you see I'm connecting to a web server for less encrypted ORT. It is HTTPS. So that means encrypted connection. And also you see there is a small padlock. So when you click that, it says, okay, this certificate, this, this is a secured connection. So when you click that, it shows who is certifying this public key, the web server. It's certified by a CA called Let's Encrypt Report. And it says secure connection, right? So similarly, you can see the public key certificates which exchange in between this communication. How do you see these public key certificates? So for that, you have to go to the Firefox configurations. So in the Firefox, there is edit preference tag. So when you go to the edit preference, there you can see privacy and security tag. When you go to the down of this privacy and security tag, you can see a button called new certificate. Similarly, so other browsers also there as a preferences configuration. In there, you can find the window for certificate management window. So in this certificate management window, you have several tabs, what we call user certificate, people certificate, server certificate, and authority certificate. Certification authority certificates are under authority certificate tab. So you see there are hundreds of certification authorities by default installed in this tab. So let me open one of these certificates. You can click that and say view. So when you view that certificate, it shows the attributes. As I mentioned, it shows the certificate issued to a company called Global Chamber Zine Group in 2008, and it address is there, whatever organization is there, serial number is there. <coughs> that is issued. And then you see there's a one call issued by. So when you check the issue two and issued by, both are same. So if both are same, that means, so this certificate is self-signed. Self-signed means people who own it, certifying it itself. So that type of public key certificates, we call it as root certificate. Root certificate means there are no CEA certifying their public keys, only the person who is owning that public key certifying that public key itself. So that is called root public key certificate. So all the certification authority certificates are usually root certificates. So when you go into detail of such root certificates, you can see different attributes, different fields. So there is a version number, serial number, 
So it's a signature algorithm because certificate itself is a digital signed document. So it has a signature algorithm. Issue uh, who is issuing this public key certificate, validity period. Validity period has two entries, not before. So that is the time it issued that, not after. So until that time it's valid. So when you carefully look that, so you see this particular certificate is valid till July 31st, 2038. So kind of roughly 20 years, long time. So I mean the certification authority issued the root certificate with such long validity period to, to make sure some of these, uh, to solve some of these uh, certificate management problems. Uh, unfortunately, so that's how it is, but we are not recommending to having such longer valid period, but the certification authority, however, do that. Uh, so like that, so there are so many attributes in the digital certificate, like subject is the owner of that, and this the public key information. You see, this has two fields, public key algorithm field and the public key field. Algorithm field tells which kind of public key algorithm use. I said that there are three public key systems, RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and, and elliptic curve. So it says RSA public key is using these certificates, and this is the public key, public key in the kind of binary format. So I so, stored so there. In addition to that, there are some other parameters. So that's how the certificate look like. So this particular certificate is self-signed certificates because it issue and the issue two and it should buy. That is issue and the subject is the same. So like that, there are so many root certificates by default installed on your browsers. So similarly, there are web server certificates, other people's certificates, maybe your certificates also there. Some personal entities or the people can hold public key certificates. So for example, I am having a public key certificate. When you have a look, so I have a public key certificates installed in this browser. My name is there, organization and other details are there. Issued by a certification authority called UCSC certification authority. It's my institute certification authority. So similarly that, uh, people uh, can have public key certificates. So in by default, so when you open that tab, certificate management tab of your browser, you may not have your own certificates. You may only have the authority certificates or the root certificate. When you get a public key in the same format, your web server, so that public key is verified against those keys stores there. So because of Sir. that, this is very critical. Yes. Sir, some message comes uh, from participant. Uh, yes. Please check check this message. The certificate view option is not showing their browser, maybe. Uh, Sorry, that's the TLS transaction. Uh, what what the message says? Uh, Mr. Rashid, he is says yeah, I mean, certificate view option is not showing. So ah, it's wiki. So which browser they are using? Um, they did not write the which browser. Uh, uh -huh. Also, so two or more so in the browser, says, different browsers, uh, different browsers has a uh, different um, panels. So I am demonstrating uh, with the Firefox browser. So in the Firefox browser, if you want to go to this panel, you have to go to the Firefox uh, preferences uh, and or oh, maybe the different version have different you kind of go to edit preferences and there you need to go to the privacy and security and then you go down and then you may see the certificate button and then you have to press view certificates so then you go into the certificate tab uh, maybe yes they can follow it Yes, experience yes. Uh, participants can be uh, do the uh, like that, and that can find yes. the certificate options. Yes. So then, under I'm um, explaining this authority. So there are different uh, authorities certificates installed in this stack. So those are called root certificates. So all the certificates public keys received from the web server verify against using this 
seems so difficult. Because of that, they are very critical. Unfortunately, Firefox like browsers, they provide some buttons to remove and edit those. So how we reach to this panel and how do you manage, it depends on the version of the browser you're having plus the model of the browser. So maybe Firefox have in different place, maybe Chrome has in different place like that. So you need to kind of find it out by using your browser where is that uh, locator. Right? Okay. Uh, so you can try it out. So I just using this Firefox, but different Firefox version may have different places uh, to show in it. Uh, so somehow you need to go to view certificate. There is a place in any browser to view the public key certificates belongs to uh, or install in this particular browser. Right. So then I want to show you Let's say you want to get the public key certificates uh, for your web server. So there is a free certification authority for that. Nowadays, very popular. So this free public key certification authority is called as less centered. So this is the that particular authority web page. They issue the public key certificates free of charge to any web server in order to get their certificate, we have to use a tool called setboard. So this is the URL of the setboard. So using this setboard, you can install a setboard in your Linux or whatever system. So this setboard will automatically fetch the public key certificates from this less encrypted service and you can install it in your web browser. Right, uh, so I come to that. As you may see, Somehow, web browsers come with default certification authority, set of default certification authorities installed in this browser. So you are by default trusting those certification authorities. So whenever your browser is your public key, you are verifying that public key against these certification authorities. Because of that, so this the certification authorities are very important, right? So when you think about these public key certificates, there are different versions of those public key certificates. So have a look in this public key certificate, sorry, which receive to this less encrypt or maybe set board. Let's say set board, user. So I'm on the uh, web server call. HTTPS set board EFF.org. So it has a small padlock that shows I'm using TLS. So when I click on that, it shows the detail. So you can see the connection is a secure connection. When you press that, it says verify by less entry. The verified by means this is the certification authority name. So issued to company called set board. So that's, you can see the detail in the Firefox. Uh, uh, and other thing, uh, basically you can notice it here. So this green color, this green color padlock. So this color shows some certificate versions. Let me go back to the, my slide step to explain that. Uh, explain that. Uh, at present, uh, the version of the public key certificate you are using is SSL uh, uh, X509 public key certificate version 3. In addition to that, there is another version called extended validation public key certificates or the EE public key certificates. Technically, X509 format and the EV format is similar technically similar, but there is a difference, legal difference. So for example, if some certification authority issued extended validation public key certificates after doing some legal verification. So that means certification authority verifies 
party who requesting such extended validation public key certificates are the parties who legally owning this entity or the parties who legally accessing this entity as a regular certificate issued after verification of the domain name. That means if you can show, so you are handling a particular domain, you can get a regular public key certificate at any time. Usually using setboard and the let's encrypt, you are getting such certificates, uh, X509 certificates. If you need the highest level certificates, that means high verifications so then you have to go for extended validation certificates extended validation certificate issued kind of check the legal validation other thing is when they issue the extended validation certificates they will check the semantic problems as well so for example so let's say there is a company called bank of west so usually bank of west write it as Bank of West W E S T com, right? So that is the correct page. So someone can request instead of W double V. So so then people, somebody who look at that domain, they might think that is Bank of West. It's not that West. So it's not W. It's double V. So that could it has semantic attacks. So then people can use a semantically similar kind of look like public domains and execute phishing attacks. So we, usually people cannot get external validation certificates to such domain. Plus people cannot get external validation certificates without proving they are legally owning these domains, without sending the legal documents. Because of that, so when you see an extended validation certificate, you might feel extra, kind of extra validation. So, so how do you know that you receive extended validation certificate? So if you receive such certificates, your location bar should be green, or, or some browser will show the padlock in the green card. So if you are using these regular certificates, you may see the kind of padlock in the lock state, and sometimes yellow color, sometimes green. Sorry, sometimes <coughs> white. So if you use this HTTP, your location bias should be white. So that's how they indicate the certificates you receive. As I mentioned, so when you use, uh, if you want to install uh, public key certificates, there is a new protocol uh, introduced. Uh, to the world called Automated Certificate Management Environment, Automatic Certificate Management Environment, or ACMP protocol. Let's encrypt and the set board use this ACMP protocol to automatically manage this public key. Because in the public keys uh, or TLS protocol, all the communication algorithms are very secure. The only problematic part is this public key verification. Because if someone cheat this public key verification, they can cheat entire system. So like automatic certificate management protocols try to automate this process and to solve this problem. And so I usually recommend if you just need to set it up a TLS web server, so you can use LS entry together with Setboard to install that. Setboard will automatically install uh, public key certificate from you by fetching it from less encrypt CS. So they are using regular X509 certificates. If you are a commercial entity, you cannot survive with this free certificate. There you have to purchase public key certificate uh, from the certification authority, commercial certification authorities. Okay, let's say you have set up a SSL web server. So then how do you make sure you have properly configured that? So that there is a free testing tool available. So that is called SSL Labs. Uh, so you can visit this SSL Labs com and give uh, a web server you want to test. 
So that will automatically test your SSL web server and provide you a report so that you, you are quite sure your configuration of this is correct. So let me show that by sharing back my uh, browser. So yeah, my <coughs> private browser. So this is what we call SSL Labs. SSL Labs website, it's an online website. So if you want to test your browser, whether this particular browser is capable of handling SSL, you can just say test my browser. So this uh, uh, website will automatically test your browser and give you the capabilities of your browser. So user agent is the browser. Your user agent has good protocol support and your user agent is not vulnerable for those kind of attacks. Uh, and they say it supports uh, TLS version 1.3. And you see it says the algorithm it supported, what we call it as Cypher Suite. Cypher Suite, what kind of algorithm? So you see, let's take a talk. It say TLS, transport layer security with AES algorithm, encryption algorithm is AES and 128 bit key encryption. And there is a block mode, encryption blocking mode to GCM. So it's a cryptography detail. I will uh, not take it into this class. And then this is a hashing algorithm. And it's a forward secrecy. Uh, so this is forward secrecy, like that you see. So they say these are weak, weak protocols. And these are the recommended forward secrecy protocols which your browser support. EC means elliptic curve. DHCV and DCM. So that means elliptical DCM protocol. So that means AES246 protocols. Like that, there are different cryptographic protocol combinations uh, supported by the browsers. So this particular browser support all of these combinations. Among them, green ones are the combinations. So basically, so the web server also should support these combinations to have proper communication. And you see the protocol details and things like that. So this is how you're going to test your browser. If you want to test your web server, you go there and give So maybe in Triangle there's a bank web server for DLC. Let's see that whether it is tested. Uh, or it says, uh, cannot connect, maybe let's see whether it is, uh, uh, this is not SSL perhaps. Uh, I think it's SSL. So this is SSL, you see it's a uh, index, uh, extended validation certificate. So let's get that URL. And I want to check that. <coughs> right, it's testing for different TLS version, which version it supports, and it test. It gives the detail of this uh, web server configurations. Uh, so you see the, the this is certificate detail and the key size it uses, uh, and so you see other details are given. They are still performing the test. Uh, so you see. So it's 86% complete. So you see this, this bank uh, use not the paid certificate, it use a less encrypt certificate. So this is a VOC uh, valid from there. Issue is let's encrypt. You see, let's encrypt. So, this certificate is signed by uh, these uh, algorithms and it's a good state, not revoked. Uh, and there is a one called DNSCAA. 
So I, I will talk with you in a minute. So then you see it, give a report. Uh, so it's writing this web server as grade A. It's attached with certificate. Uh, protocol support is good. Key exchange is kind of less. Cycle strength is kind of less. Uh, this supports TLS version 3. It's experiment still, but it support. Uh, and so on, detail. So this is kind of newly introduced uh, feature called DNCA. So this is a new new attribute we can put it into a DNS server. CA attribute like MX record, like you know there are DNS record like CA records we can put it into the DNS servers, and it is not there in this particular server. What that means, basically, so in the TLS there is an attack called TLS man in the middle attack. I'll come to it in a minute. So in order to reduce such attacks, they have introduced this new field to the DNS server. So when you set it up, uh, whatever this domain name, webuc.lk, we can tell using this uh, attribute, new we are introduced attribute, we can tell that. So this domain is certified by a particular certification authority. So then the web browser can verify whether that domain is certified by that certification authority. If the web browser receive a web certificate which certify by a different certification authority which is not mentioned in this field so web browser wants that so that kind of can can that can stop kind of many in the Google attacks happening right now so that is not supported for this cell like that you can see all uh, details of this particular web server if uh, version numbers, cycle switch use, cache simulation. Cache simulation means if the different clients connect, so for which algorithms they are negotiated. So for example, some clients may have uh, weak versions of algorithms, some clients may have strong versions. So then both parties, client and server has to agree with the common, common algorithms. <coughs> so they simulate the Compliance phones, browsers, and so on, and shows which this device they agree to this algorithm, which this device they agree to that algorithm. And there we can check whether we properly configure the web server. Like that, they, this website, SSL Labs, give us a very detailed, perfect report so to check the installation of our web server. All right. So then I'll back to my presentation, uh, sharing back the slides. All right. Uh, sharing. So, so I discussed, uh, so far what, what we discussed, we discuss how the TLS works in very technical detail. So then we discuss how do you install or obtain a free public key certificates for our SSL web server. Then we discuss how do you set the, uh, how do you test the web server. Then let's see the one of the pain problem with this TLS protocol. So these TLS protocols are vulnerable to what we call it as man in the middle attacks. So that means, so somebody who has controls to your domain or the browser can cheat you at the middle. So in other words, can listen the TLS encryption at the middle. So this party can break TLS communication. So uh, usually, if you establish the TLS communication, so they encrypt the data from the browser directly to the server. No one at the middle should not be able to listen. But if you are into this attack, so your uh, connection get break at the middle. How that good happens? So that's how it happens. So you say this is your browser. This is, let's say, your bank. You want to connect with the TLS. So there might be an attack at the middle. <coughs> so what's happening? First of all, 
He said, give me the HTTPS, my bank on the page. So that witness directly, <clears throat> not directly go to the bank, instead of some attacker at the middle page. So how the attacker do that? Attacker can do it in various ways. Simple method is somehow attack has access to the browser <coughs> and he can set it up a proxy. He can set it up this victim's browser to go through the attacker's proxy server. What we call it as web proxy servers. In the other lecture, next lecture, I will show you such web proxy servers. Right. So then what's happened? <coughs> then what happened? So then uh, this attacker configured to go going this communication through their proxy server. It's usually it's when you connect to the web, so we go through the different web proxy servers, you know, cache servers. So any of the cache servers may be controlled by such attacks. So usual cache servers, what they do, or the web proxy server, what they do, when they get this SSL client hello or request from the client, so saying get this page, usually these proxy servers forward that request to the particular web server. But in this attack proxy servers, what they do, they don't forward this get to this back. Instead, they keep that here and generate new client hello message. They generate a new SSL hello message to the bank. For the bank web server, he may not able to identify this client from at this hello comes from an attacker or a browser. Because usually the this SSL web servers are not authenticating clients. So we are only authenticating the servers. So we get the public key of this to that side. There are no public keys from that side. So just a hello message, attacker keep that and create a new hello to the bank. So bank doesn't know it's from where. Bank think it's from a browser. <coughs> so bank responds to that using whatever the SSL hello and then bank sends the public key of his server. So then what the, this attacker do? Attacker keep that public key certificate which sends by the bank instead of attackers in the buggy, buggy or the regenerated bogus public key to the browser. When that public key reached to the browser, your browser may display a bad certificate warning, or else sometimes it may not generate that in case this attacker's root certificate is sold yet. So for example, if the attacker has the money, he can set it up a root certificate, kind of his root certificate, get it installed in your browser. Or maybe using some other social engineering method, or maybe if attacker has free access to your browser, so attacker can install his root certificate here. If that get installed, if attacker issue a buggy certificate to this bank, so that also get verified. Because your browser thing, it is the correct public key from the bank. Actually, that public key is not from the bank, it's from the attacker. So the public key from the bank is keep by the attack. Right. So when that public key reached to the browser, the browser execute what we call SSL key exchange between the attacker and the browser. Simultaneously, attacker execute a key exchange between his proxy and the bank server. So the bank server, this attacker is another browser. So then there are two parallel key SSL key exchange goes. And there may be a key K1 in between, key K2 in between. So then what's happened? 
your browser will encrypt the data with K, K1 and it comes to the attacker, attacker will decrypt that and re-encrypt using K, K2 and send to the bank. Bank doesn't know where it's from, attacker or the bro correct browser. Bank take it from the correct user because the correct information comes, correct user and password comes, encrypted with K, K2. So then banks work based on that data. However, the attacker gets an opportunity to re record entire communication here. So that's how the TLS and in the middle attack works. So this is very common. So for example, if, let's say you are using uh, internet lodge, internet cafe uh, to go online, or, or maybe you are using uh, while you are traveling uh, uh, free Wi-Fi at an airport or some public place, or maybe an uh, internet browser available on a public place to go online. So then we don't know, we never know. So that browser available in the public place or the internet cafe may con pre-configure to do, do, do this attack. So then what happens? So when you type your confidential information, such as username, password, crypto numbers, so those things will get recorded by the attacker. And you may not notice that. So if you want to notice that, when you get this SSL-based web page, you have to click on this padlock and see whether who certified the public key of that. So then you have to have idea about your bank public key certified by this company. If you get the public key uh, certified by a different company, so then you can get a feeling, okay, I'm under attack. But it is very, really difficult. So because we even we don't know, or we are not checking, when you log into a, uh, any page or the Gmail or whatever, we are not checking that which public key we receive. If you want to check that, we have to click that padlock and check that, but no one doing that. So then at any time, we may fall into this, what we call it as TLS man in the middle attack. So that is the very dangerous situation of the TLS. So that is not the weakness of the TLS protocol. Protocol is perfect. That is weakness of how we handling the public key because entire protocols based on the public key of web server, if you receive the correct public key of the web server, protocol will work perfectly. But if you receive the bogus public key of web server, protocol can break at the middle. Sometimes, not by the attackers, but by the governments and organizations break, do that attacks, do that configuration. So if that is called it as maybe you heard about deep packet inspection, uh, DPI, DPI firewalls. So those, what they do, they send such buggy certificates and break your SSL connection at the middle and look at your traffic in order to detect intruders. Maybe governments will look at the traffic in order to spy on their citizens. So, so at any point, even we use TLS, we may go into this uh, man in the middle attacks. So because of that, even we can see padlock, even we can see TLS, you need to be careful. With that, I can conclude the uh, session today and rest of the time as usual. I can get the questions posed by the users. Okay, I see some questions. Uh, so in the first question asked, is there any other tool like OpenSSC generate and test public key cryptography? There are some, in the, if you use Java package, in the, they have a, a tool called key tool. You can use the key tool to do that. So these are the two tools which are the OpenSSL or key tool to generate those keys. And then there is a question, a new JPG signature was applied to custom JPG as well, right? Does it mean that we use the digital signature of one file when it applied to the whole files in the same country? And no, actually, uh, it, it, it means uh, if we sign some file, so it's well, signature means encrypted hash. If the content of other file is the same, the hash of that file also the same. So then the signature also the same. 
so it's not attached to, but if I sign it, so that signature matched to all similar files. So that's what happened there. So then there was a question asking, what is the function of SSL? Or oh, SSL now refers as TLS. Function of TLS is to protect the communication between your browser and the web server. So protection means confidentiality, integrity, and authentication of web servers. <coughs> right? Then there is a question for, does TLS transaction have any dependency on the client operating system? Actually, not. Uh, in, in, in general speaking, TLS depend on the browser. browser and the web server. So the, all the functionality is implemented at the browser level, not the operating system level. So it's depend on the browser. So if you use some browser version on Windows, and if you use the same browser version on Linux, they both works in the same strength or the same level. So then there is a question, is it possible to create a security certificate for internet web servers? If possible, can you mention how to create that implement, for example, Okay, so we can use two things. One is you can use a uh, less encrypt to do that, or you can use OpenSSL. OpenSSL to create a, a public key certificate to internet web servers like any IP address and so on, are some in us. So I didn't demonstrate that because it's kind of a little complicated. So if some in interest in the next session, I can share some scripts and show you how to use OpenSSL to run your own certification authority and issue this public key certificate to your own servers like that. So you can run your own certification infrastructure just using OpenSSL. So, and there are commands to do so. So those commands are a little complicated. So I will maybe share you later on some scripts which can do that in the next, next week. And then Pradeep Kumar asks, how will we create Oh, on the same question. Definitely, I will share the scripts uh, so you can create your own certificate and certification infrastructure with those scripts. So those scripts use OpenSSL. So actually, it's the CA depend on the OpenSSL. Uh, and then, is it possible to get the list of websites using same root certificate? Um, I don't know about that. So, so how to get the Website use same root certificate. Uh, no, I'm not aware of such websites because there are millions of certification SSL servers out there certified by different years. Uh, not aware of methods to find it out there. Sorry. And then it has this explain semantic attack and cyber spread. Actually, the semantic attacks means. Uh, that basically means, uh, I'm not so sure what you mean, but, yes, but basically it's, it's semantic attacks means actually, so you lo use look like domain names. So maybe for the facebook.com, you use maybe facebook.info and get a public key certificate for the facebook.info. And then uh, you create a look like website. Uh, uh, and then those look like website, uh, 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 make use uh, to do a phishing attacks and so on. Can you explain Poodle attack on SSL version 3? I'm not really knows about how it works. So interesting question. We'll have a look and answer in the next week, Damit. Damit asks, can you explain Poodle attack on SSL version 3? I will have a look and explain definitely in next week. And then uh, Niraj asks, which web browser is much secure? Uh, <clears throat> I don't have again the answer for that. So it depends, I think, uh, so your, uh, which version of the browser, I think that's much important because not the which browser, uh, the version of the browser. If you use any browser, kind of you have to use the latest version. Uh, I have no perfect answer for that. Because all the browsers kind of they 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 usually up to standard I think, uh, and so there is a question: Are some organizations use wildcard certificate? Do you think that is more uh, more man in the middle attack, or as public keys easily? Uh, 
Uh, so in the man in the middle attack can execute on any public certificate. It doesn't matter a wild card or not. Uh, so if you use a wild card certificate, uh, kind of easy to, uh, he is correct, it's kind of easy to execute man in the middle attack because anything we can use uh, after instead of stop. So, but uh, theoretically, uh, any public certificate uh, could be man in the middle attack, can uh, uh, go into this man in the middle attack. Uh, Niraj asks, could you please explain more about RSA keys, how it creates secure connection using uh, Fuji? That is SSL, SSH, secure shell. Uh, I will explain because there is a separate lecture later on uh, network security via SSH. Basically, any RSA key exchange, what happens? So the server has public private key pairs. So at the first connection, server sends its public key. So it's the putty user is a public key. So then when the server public key receive to the client software, uh, SSH client or SSL client or TLS client. TLS client is the browser which we discussed today. So in the SSH, it's a different protocol. They are the same. So when you use a public key, so it's the same thing happens. So random number is generated, encrypt that using the public key, send to the server, so decrypt it, then both parties ask for random number which use as the master key. So that key will create a series of session keys. So those session keys will be used to encrypt the channel. So the encryption is usually symmetric key. Public key is used only to exchange the keys. You may we get clear about it when we go into uh, this SSH protocol later on. And then there is a question asking how, how, uh, how space of special characters are encrypted? It is using ASCII code. Uh, any any character you use, basically for the encryption, they take it the binary. So if you use any character in any Unicode or whatever, so then there is a binary presentation, you know. So the encryption algorithm take it as binary and encrypt and create any a binary output. So then it doesn't matter uh, which character it is. Uh, and what is the difference between PEM and the CRT? Uh, so they, they are different file formats. So PEM uh, re, uh, refers for privacy and knows mail. So usually when you store public private key pairs, in the, if you want to store them in the text format, so we use the format of PEM. So the public private key actually was used for email security, not for internet or the web. A PEM is the format which we used at that time in the 80s before the internet. Uh, so that is the PEM, PEM format. And the CRT is a kind of a binary format. So if the public so key uh, or whatever public key certificates data store in a binary format, call it as PKCS7, public key cryptography standard number seven format. So in that format used, we store it in the binary. So if the file is in the binary, so it calls CRT. If the file is in text, it calls it as PM. We can convert from PEM to CRT, CRT to PEM or whatever. So these conversion tools are available. Even open access will do, uh, do that. Could you please explain more about setboard? Okay, actually the setboard is just a tool which implemented this ACME and you can remember this protocol, uh, automatic public key, automatic public key environment, or automatic whatever this protocol, ACME protocol uh, is implemented, setboard has implemented that. Setboard is a tool which implements that protocol. Using that ACME protocol, we can con con communicate with the certification authority automatically and reading our public keys and so on. So then we don't need to do it manually. In the regular setup, what we have to do is, we have to create public private key pair using OpenSSL, then we have to export our public key as I demonstrated, and then we have to submit that public key to a certification authority in a format that we call X509 certificate request format or the PEM format or CRT format. So then this public key certificate go to the certification authority. So this certification authority issue the certificate and we have to manually download it and install in our website. 
So all process is manual. So using ACME, so people try to automate that. So the set board is a tool which do that. So when you run the set board, it automatically detect web server, it has which web server you want to configure. So then it generate key pair for you and it submit the public key to the certification authority which support ACME automatically. Then they know uh, uh, that uh, protocol and then certification authority certify your public keys and set board will fetch it automatically and then install in the correct place. So you don't need to do anything. You can just run set board, everything will set it up. So you can try it out. So if you're interested later on, I will show a demo how to use set board. So it's very simple. If you want a domain name, you can run set board immediately and set it up uh, uh, SSL enable certification authority with let's encrypt certification server. And then you can put the renew commands in the ground of whatever. So then it's uh, after every six months, set board will fetch a new certificate from uh, let's encrypt and keep updating your SSL web server. You don't need to do anything manually. So idea of set board is to, uh, a functionality of set board is the automatic certificate management. Okay, I think I have answered the questions so far I have. Uh, so this lecture is somewhat little technical, I agree. So you might get boring because it is protocol works with public key, private key and so on. So, but last part of this lecture I have showed you some tools where you can try it out or you can check your browser strength, you can check your server strength and so on. <coughs> so you can use those tools to your day-to-day -day <coughs> kind of activities. So I post few questions to answer in the next week. So one is um, to students and most of you may interest how to run your own certification authority. So I have promised uh, you to give some tools to uh, set it up, your own certification authority, and some student has some attack called Poodle attack and how it works on SSL version three. I will have a look on that and explain it in the next week before I start the lecture next week. Okay, any questions you want? Any other questions? Okay, dear participant, if you have any question, please uh, press the hand raise button. Then you can ask. Okay, I think no questions. Uh, I think no questions. <laughs> yes, sir. So, sir, uh, one email has been sent uh, from Torit, sir. Uh, we are thinking uh, to have a, a taking a midterm exam for the party mm -hmm. participant. So. Uh, if we announce uh, earlier, so participants can make them uh, prepare for the exam themselves. So if you explain details when or how we can uh, arrange this exam after okay. this class. Uh, so I'm still uh, discussing uh, with uh, uh, your people, how do we conduct this exam? So, so the exam, definitely I thought of giving uh, multiple choice question, MCQ type question with single answer. Uh, and I'm still thinking about whether I give it at the mid or at the end. So, so I will think about how you can do that and will announce. So, so still uh, we need to give few more lectures uh, to ask some good questions. So, uh, we, 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 we decided to have multiple choice questions with single answer. Uh, the date, uh, perhaps we announce later on. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So, thank you very much, Paul. So, then the next lecture on, uh, is on next Tuesday, right? Tuesday. Yes, sir. Next Tuesday morning. morning. Yes. Right.